Welcome everybody to Red Hat Cloud Forms, Server Charger OpenStack. I'm Jason Rittenauer, a cloud domain architect here at Red Hat, and I work primarily with public sector customers specializing in the uh, management portfolio of products. Yep, and I'm Kevin Jones. I am also on the cloud domain architecture team for North American public sector. I particularly focus in OpenStack and Red Hat virtualization. So today what we're going to talk about, um, we're going to go into first here is uh, Jason. We just wanted to tell you a little bit about ourselves. So Jason is uh, wildly known inside of Red Hat at, as the foremost expert on dinosaurs. He uses Cloud Forms and Ansible to automate the publishing of his research internally. That's right. And Kevin Jones is the physically strongest employee at Red Hat. He literally carries around a data center everywhere he goes. You might have seen it down in the uh, Ecosystem Expo today, that hat trick box. That was all Kevin. Carries it everywhere. Yeah, I feel naked without my cloud, man. So. Um, so we want to talk about a couple themes today. So don't, uh, don't take this session as a, uh, any hit on OpenStack itself and the capabilities it have. Think about enhancing OpenStack. So I love OpenStack. I've been working with it here at Red Hat the last two and a half years. Before that, I was working with it at NASA to uh, optimize and uh, build out our capabilities with the infrastructure we had. And uh, so we're going to go through three themes basically today. So enhancing the user experience of OpenStack itself. So particularly around the dashboard capability of OpenStack, which is Horizon, and what cloud forms can add on top of that and make it better for a user experience. Uh, increased visibility. So in your cloud, having increased visibility all throughout the stack. Um, you have some insight into OpenStack, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But cloud forms can really expand that capability. And then for Jason and myself and our particular customer base, uh, security is particularly important. And so there's a lot of capabilities that Open, OpenStack exposes from the security side that cloud forms can take advantage of. And so we're going to go through that as well. So we're going to start with OpenStack, so, though. So the, uh, for those that don't know, OpenStack is a cloud software. It was a joint venture between NASA and Rackspace, actually, back in the day. Uh, NASA get, figured that they were not in the business of developing software and uh, got NASA headquarters to agree to throw it over the fence, make it open source, which was great for everybody else. Um, it is a set of packages and projects that bring public cloud capabilities into your own data center. There were a couple, uh, and there still are a few left, public cloud uh, vendors out there offering OpenStack as a public cloud. But by and large, OpenStack is utilized in your own data centers on premises. So it is all open source, um, made up of many, many different projects pulled together. Think of it as a bunch of applications pulled together to give you cloud services in your data center. It's all API driven, so everything is API first. And this is important when you think about the dashboard capability because the dashboard capability takes advantage of the APIs, but it doesn't necessarily expose all the features of the API out, right? So, uh, but with this set in your data center and these APIs and the capability gives you great flexibility and automation to take your storage, your compute, and everything, tie this all together and expose it. These are the projects, that, mainly the core projects. So on the bottom side of this, if, if you've never seen this, this is what the infrastructure service components are made of. So you have the compute project, several storage projects, and the networking project, which uh, adds in a, a software-defined networking layer. And you tie all those things together with shared services, like identity management uh, via the Keystone project and uh, the dashboard. And we're going to focus a lot on the dashboard today because um, Cloud Forms itself really enhances that capability. The dashboard project is named Horizon. So you see the names on the bottom are the actual names of the projects in, uh, in OpenStack Foundation. Horizon was originally built to demo what someone might do to create a dashboard for OpenStack. Okay, so uh, originally, very early on, it, it had very, very limited capability. Uh, over the years, it has gotten much better and much more usable and, and capable. It has some really pretty some decent visualization in it, but it ex also exposed a lot of choices to the users that it, uh, some rudimentary type users not, might not need to make. So uh, some of the other components that can be built on top of that are things like Sahara, which is like data analytics cluster as a service. Um, Ironic is a bare metal provisioning service, so you can actually offer bare metal servers. And then Heat is an orchestration engine, uh, kind of like cloud formation in AWS. And then the, the last component I want to talk to you on this slide is our uh, installer. So it's called Red Hat OpenStack Platform Director. You'll hear me talk about that. In the upstream, it's called Triple O. Um, and we use this to make the complexity that is this easy, okay? Or easier, I should say. 
Um, I don't intend for you all to go through and read this. I just want to show this, that if you think about all the components in that slide that have to be tied together and networked and communicating, and you think about doing that at a scale of 100, 500, 1,000 nodes in your data center, there is some complexity there, particularly on the networking side and the storage side and making that all work together. So we have taken it upon ourselves uh, in Red Hat OpenStack platform to take the ease of some of those things and implement that in our installation mechanism. So when you talk about planning, you have to think about the network topology, the way the services are going to be configured, and then how you're going to handle resources and capacity moving forward. You take that into deployment. So the way we do deployment is actually a set of uh, infrastructure templates. So they're actually heat templates, which means I can ver version control my cloud, uh, at least the code that was used to deploy it, which is excellent. Um, so from when customers are talking to me, they're having an issue, I just tell them to provide me those templates. I can know exactly what their cloud would deploy like. Um, the last piece that we do, uh, Red Hat in particular does, and are really the only ones on the market really truly offering this, uh, is we handle updates and upgrades for OpenStack. And the reason we don't call our installer triple O in our product is because we consider Director all about being able to life cycle management uh, an OpenStack cloud. So doing updates, upgrades, scaling up and down, we want to make those operations easy. And in OSP 13, which will drop in a few months, uh, we will actually do fast forward upgrades from 10, OSP 10 up to 13. Now, where it sits in the big picture of everybody's infrastructure is uh, in the private cloud space mostly now. So you think about infra infrastructure as a service in your data center, that's where OpenStack really fits today. But you'll notice, and everybody in this room has other infrastructure beyond just OpenStack, and so we are going to talk about how CloudForms can take care of this big picture here. Right, so this is a diagram of what CloudForms looks like in terms of the various things it can talk to and manage. Uh, we do, of course, bundle it with OpenStack to manage that, give it a better, more consumable uh, sec uh, next day, second day uh, user interface. But it does also interoperate with VMware, which that's actually how the current version of CloudForms began its life. It was actually a proprietary product called Manage IQ that won best in show at VMworld a couple times. Then Red Hat acquired it, open sourced it, pointed it at Red Hat virtualization and OpenStack so that we could have that same sort of uh, uh, service management and orchestration targeted against all sorts of different virtualization platforms. And you can see what it brings to the table is self-service and service life lifecycle management compliance and governments, insight into the efficiency and optimization of your virtual machines, and of course automation using Ansible. So you've got this single pane of glass to manage all these disparate environments and technologies. Yeah, and what I like about that, so today we're going to focus on CloudForms interacting with OpenStack in particular, but a lot of the capabilities you'll see or hear from CloudForms can be applied to these other providers as well. So the nice thing about CloudForms is, again, it's all leveraging these same APIs Kevin's been talking about. It's talking directly to Solometer, to Nova, to Neutron, to pull in information about the computes, uh, compute instances running, about the software-defined networking, software-defined storage. It doesn't require any special configurations on the OpenStack side or any agents to be installed on any of the hypervisors. It's just taking the IPs, uh, APIs and talking to them as as you would through the Horizon interface. Yeah, so if anybody has been down at the booth and saw my cloud there, the way I'm doing that is I have o OpenStack as the foundational layer, and I deploy CloudForms appliances on OpenStack. So it's a workload consuming the capabilities, but it's also managing them through the APIs, which is really awesome. Um, so let's focus first on user experience, and this is going to be about Horizon. So Horizon in and of itself, you log in, you can see things. You, uh, it's, uh, OpenStack is multi-tenant by default. So as a project owner, you can log in. You see how much of your quotas you're using. You can launch instances. You can add objects to an S3 database uh, or S3 service. But, um, but in and of itself, it, 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 it leaves a lot to be desired. So you can have advanced users that get in here and know what they're doing and, and really can move themselves around. But like, think about the fact that when you give a brand new project, you have to create uh, a tenant network for them access to put the instances on. You have to create a router so they can get out. You have to hook the public, route, uh, public uh, network to the router and then hook the um, tenant network to that router as well. And like even that simple thing for non-advanced users is not, not uh, trivial. So uh, we want to take CloudForms and use that to expose 
services that we can control, right, and have flexibility around what actually gets provisioned, and we can do that here with Cloud Forms and the Service Catalog, right? Right. That's the idea behind Cloud Forms is we're, we're going beyond just provisioning simple virtual machines. Uh, we're looking at, at the actual service lifecycle. So we've designed this self-service catalog that allows us to do things from as simple as provisioning a RHEL 7 instance to complex multi-tiered applications where we're standing up a database server with a couple of application servers in front of it and then maybe a load balancer in front of that. All of these things are part of that overall lifecycle and we do uh, set it up through a simple shopping cart type interface so users can just go in and pick out the resources they want. We can give them control over what uh, sort of parameters we want them to be able to configure, like maybe some groups we want to be able to choose an instance size, for example. Uh, but maybe some of those groups we don't, have, we don't want to have all of the instance sizes available. Maybe they only need like a small and a medium rather than large. So we can get really granular with what we are allowing the users to request through that portal, and then we can also end, go into this workflow here where we're requiring administrator approval for certain requests, uh, checking quota validation, and again, all of this is customizable based on the user or group making the request and what kind of item they're requesting. So, again. Yeah. And so, to take that a step out, right, so this, these workflows will take advantage of the capabilities of OpenStack, so all the things that OpenStack does well, CloudForms takes advantage of that, but you then can expose other things on that, like even a manual in approval process, for instance. So a manager has to check off, yes, these resources or these services are good to go. Um, so tying all that together and making that easy is important. So what we're going to do here is we're going to demo uh, first what it's like to provision a, um, an instance in OpenStack. If you've, um, if you've not seen that before, so we're going we're gonna to walk through this. So this is, my, um, this is my user page as a project owner. And um, I'm going to log in here to uh, or move over to the instances page. I'll launch. So there's a little wizard I can walk through. I'll give it a name. I could spin up four of these if I wanted to. I'm just going to do one here. I have to make some choices about the storage back end. So I'm going to tell it to boot off an image. Um, I'm not going to create a sender volume for that. And you think about it, I talked about the advanced users versus like a business user. Yeah, or what's a sender volume, Kevin? <laughs> exactly. So exposing those choices out to the user may not be something you want to do. So I'm going to pick that RHEL 7.4 instance. Um, and all of these things obviously can be done through the API or the CLI as well. But today we're just focused on the user experience of the dashboard. So I'm going to pick the flavor, which is an M1 small. I'm going to pick a private network, so now I have to make a choice about what network it's going to end up on. I'm going to set up security groups for the firewall settings and all that. I'm going to pick a key pair, and now I'm finally ready to launch this instance, right? So as this spins up, you know, it's going to go and schedule that, and it's going to put it on this private network. But there's one more step I want to do if I actually want to expose this so I can reach it. I have to associate a floating IP to it. And so in the interface here, I have to make this a secondary step to associate this IP. And now my instance is up and running. It has an IP. But what if I wanted that RHEL 7.4 to be an Apache server or a MySQL database, for instance, or apply a DISA STIG to it, for instance? So I don't have any of those capabilities natively inside of this interface to do those more service-oriented deployments. And so. That's where we're going to see uh, CloudForm sort of take this uh, a step further. Yeah, so what Kevin was just showing us was, of course, going through the Horizon interface. And again, it bears repeating, OpenStack was designed by and for actual rocket scientists. Us normal people have trouble grasping all this and pulling it all in. So what we decided to do with CloudForms was, again, make it as user-friendly as possible, make it as simple and digestible for human beings to understand and provision. So, I'm going to show you an example of the self-service catalog in action here. You can see I've got a couple different items, a basic CentOS, a basic RHEL, uh, and then the ability to do some actual uh, combination of things like registering with satellite. So uh, notice the restricted set of choices that the user is given here, right? So he's still making a choice about the name of it. He's given a choice about development, production, or test. Now, in OpenStack, I didn't have a knowledge of those separate environments. Right. Uh, he's going to choose the... the uh, the name of the instance, the flavor of it, which is different than the ones you saw in OpenStack. So we've limited their choices by flavor, and we do the mapping on the back end. Now, I also want to point out, you notice I threw a bunch of goggly gook in there for the name. You notice that it's also saying that it doesn't like that required format, so we can do things like validation of names uh, and other parameters to make sure that 
you're complying with like, uh, you know, DNS rules and that kind of thing. And then we go down to the flavor here, you're also going to see I have a limited subset of the uh, flavors that are available. So again, this particular user doesn't need to be able to provision T2 large or whatever. They just need small, medium, large. Uh, we're going to see here the floating IP field is able to be hidden on demand based on whether, fact, whether or not the instance actually needs a floating IP. So remember, I had to take a secondary step to give a floating IP to the, to the instance. And here, it's actually pulling the ones that are available from OpenStack and allowing you to choose that on ordering. So now we're going to go, we added it to their cart, we're going to go ahead and click order here, and this is going to kick off the provisioning of that instance, and it's going to do all sorts of magic under the covers. It's going to do what you saw Kevin do through the Horizon interface by talking to the API, so it's actually provisioning the instance. But then there's another uh, part of the CloudForms service workflow where it's going to go through and check for integrations to other services. Like, for example, do you have an IPAM system that it needs to pull an address from? Do you need to reach out and create DNS records and info blocks or whatever? And then for post-provisioning, it's going to do things like run Ansible playbooks. If I, if I like, specified this to be an Apache server, it would go through and configure Apache, do anything in my playbook that was required, stig it, whatever. Uh, so there is a whole workflow you can enable for everything you provision through CloudForms. Yep, and so he's just showing in the end here that it's being provisioned through it, and it will get the uh, IP assigned. You ready? All right, so now we're going to talk about visibility. So uh, our entire stack here has an API layer that CloudForms has access to. Um, OpenStack itself has a, a couple components that we, we can see uh, about workloads themselves. So if I spin up an instance, I know what base image it was built from, right? And hopefully my system administrator has named it something useful so I know what that image was at least uh, started from. In this case, it would be RHEL 7.4. Um, I know what flavor they chose and how many resources are assigned to that. I can see what IP addresses are assigned to that instance, and I can see if it has any volumes attached. The things I can't see is what the user does with that instance after they provision it. So maybe they change the user uh, credentials for the system. Maybe they add packages that I wasn't aware of. Maybe they uh, apply some uh, security things that I don't like in my environment, like set and force zero, right? So, um, I don't have any visibility into that from OpenStack once an instance is launched. I need to get into that information, and that's where CloudForms is going to help us. One thing that we can get heavy information from from OpenStack is the telemetry service. So because, uh, because I'm running telemetry service, I know utilization on the instances that are running, and I'm gathering data about that. And then also, because of Red Hat OpenStack Platform Director, I'm talking to the physical host and keeping telemetry on the physical host. So I have the data, I just need something to take advantage of that data. And that's where CloudForms can come in too as well. Right, so CloudForms has this process built in called smart state analysis. And this allows us to do a deep inspection of the virtual machine's file systems using snapshot technology. So we don't require any agents to be installed, but using this process by taking a quick snapshot, examining the contents and then dumping it, we can see things like the packages installed down to the particular version and release. We can see user accounts configured when the last time they logged in was. So this gives us deep insight into any virtual machine that CloudForms is managing and monitoring. Again, completely agentless. So great for a brownfield environment without having to deploy agents to get this kind of insight. And then also, since version 4.5 of CloudForms, we've had a form of Ansible integrated into the CloudForms workflow. So this enables us to do things like playbooks as a service for day two operations, for example, like doing a yum update on, an, on a system or registering it with satellite, and uh, basically doing entire workflows and automation through Ansible playbooks. So if you're an Ansible user and consumer, and it's something you've been working with, we can bring that into your workflows in CloudForms and make that easier to do as well. Now what about handling things like, as a developer, I was one, I'm going to ask for what I think they're going to give me. So if, if I think I can get a, a machine with 64 gigs of RAM, and I, even though I only need two, I'm still going to ask for 64 gigs, right? And so it would be really nice to be able to take information from the telemetry service and make recommendations. And that's something CloudForms can help us with too, right, Jason? Right. So CloudForms monitors, again, using telemetry and using Solometer, the overall resource consumption of a virtual machine throughout the environment. And it gets a normal baseline for it over, the, over a range of like four weeks by default. So then it makes a 
correlation of the maximum, minimum, and average resource consumption, and then can make baseline recommendations from those performance baselines. So it offers a conservative uh, recommendation, a aggressive recommendation, and a more middle of the road recommendation. And uh, you can see, uh, if we go back to that slide for just a second, you can see where it, it'll tell you how, many, how much resources you can expect to reclaim by making these changes, both in the actual amounts and then a percentage. And sometimes it gets a little ridiculous because if you provision like an Apache server and it's not really serving any traffic, sometimes it'll sit there and show like 96 megs of usage and CloudForms will say, yeah, dial that down to, to 90, 100 megs, you're good. And most monic, modern limit, Linux distributions aren't going to like having like that small amount of RAM. So you can do some filtering to say, don't bother showing me anything less than like a gig of RAM uh, for your right sizing recommendations. So the next, we're going to talk about the uh, performance baselines at the cluster level. So CloudForms also looks at what the host and the cluster are doing. It makes uh, analysis of the trends of like the virtual machine's provision, the actual resource usage, and from there we can do some forecasting. You know, how often are you going to need to be looking at adding more nodes or more resources to your existing nodes in the cluster? So using this, you can do some predictive analytics, get an idea of when you're going to need to expand your environment and what your overall provisioning trends are looking like. Right, which is true particularly important to my customers when they're thinking about future procurement. In public sector, it takes a while to procure things. So, you know, having some data about how, that you can utilize to look forward for your capacity planning is important. And then the other thing we're constantly getting asked for is, I got all this data about this, I want to be able to apply and, or at least show users what it would cost them to consume my services based on their utilization profile. And so, this is something uh, uh, CloudForms can do for us as well. Yeah, so we have the whole concept of chargeback and showback, and another term I heard recently that I like is shameback for when you're, you just want people to see what they're actually costing you. So CloudForms has the ability to set rates for resources you're using. Uh, we can do it either at the enterprise level or individual clusters. So maybe you have like a dev cluster that, that is using older hardware that you want to set lower rates on than your production cluster. But from there we can do like tiered pricing structures. So anything under four gigs of RAM is, or is this amount, and then beyond that, it's this amount. So uh, using that, we can generate these uh, chargeback, showback reports, so you can, if you do want to do actual billing to your internal users, you can. If you just want to show them for you know, budgetary reasons, you can do that as well. The last thing we want to show here about, in regards to visibility is, I, I talked about how CloudForms is talking to all these API layers. So, um, in this case, we have an OpenShift cluster running on top of OpenStack, which was deployed by OpenStack Director. And each one of those providers in CloudForms has an API that's being talked to. And what, because CloudForms is talking to all three of them, it can actually tie the relationships together. So I can see in this screen that a particular container is in a particular pod on an OpenShift app node that's in an OpenStack VM that's on a physical host, and I can see that they're all healthy with these little green circles which is beautiful to have this visibility from the application layer all the way down to the physical host. Um, so that's, that's a really nice thing to have. And, and like we said earlier, there is no agent running in the system. It's just using, using the native capabilities of the provider it's talking to. So I'm going to log into, uh, back into Horizon here and just show you what I can see uh, from a visibility standpoint in my OpenStack environment. So I'm going to go into the admin portion of this. Um, You'll notice I get a small little bit about, um, let, me, let me bump this up a little bit. I get a, a small little bit about the projects and the amounts they're consuming, but it's literally just this report. There used to actually be some graphics up there, and they removed that in one of the, one of the uh, previous releases. I can also see my hypervisor. So in this, in this cluster, I have uh, one controller and three computes, and that controller is an all-in-one uh, hypervisor as well. So I can see that I have a certain amount of virtual CPUs uh, available. I have um, a certain amount of RAM available, and I can see the usage there. And then, like, even the storage is interesting. So this is basically the only insight I get into my storage consumption as an administrator from Horizon. So what gets really tricky here is, like, if I'm using o Nova ephemeral storage on local disk, and I've got Ceph storage doing sender and glance, like, these calculations make absolutely no sense. They're not usable at all. Um, I can drill into each hypervisor, and I can see what instances are running on them. But look at the names of them. Do, do, you, do you guys know what those are? I don't. 
Um, so, you know, I can, I can drill down and get through, but it's just not from an administrative standpoint in particular. I don't have a ton of visibility. So let's see what CloudForms can do for us uh, from, from a visibility standpoint. Right, so we're going to actually look inside a virtual machine now uh, using that smart state analysis process I talked about earlier. And again, this is going to uh, actually do a, an examination of the disk contents. Uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to go look at the user accounts on this system. Take a look at the cloud user. You can see these, the fourth one down, it's telling me when the last time this user logged in was. Now, using smart state analysis, I can also examine file contents, like the actual binary contents of a text file. Um, we have to whitelist which ones we want to collect information on, but we can actually see into like your config files, verify things are set a certain way, pull back log files. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my files that I collected through smart state, and I'm going to go over and I'm going to take a look at var log secure, because I want to see if this user did anything nefarious while they were logged in. So let me bring up var log secure here. We're going to go down. It's, you can see it's just showing me the text output of the log. I'm going to scroll down and I can see when that user logged in. They logged in over SSH using a public key. They sudoed and then they changed the password on the root account. Don't like that. Now, it's worth pointing out here that again, this is all agentless. So this isn't like a true replacement for something like a tripwire or whatever, but again, it's agentless and we can do this without needing any special configuration. So you can also enact policies that will, if we see this type of action taking place in a virtual machine, we'll either go back and fix it, send an email out to the security team, all sorts of different ways to go about handling that. All right, so the last piece we're gonna talk about today is security. So OpenStack, uh, particularly Red Hat OpenStack platform, runs on RHEL, which means we inherit all the security features of RHEL. Particularly of importance is KVM's direct integration in the Linux kernel, the network stack, and, and uh, SE Linux. So we can utilize SE Linux and its capabilities to protect ourselves there. So our operating system is providing us a secure baseline to deploy OpenStack on. And then what we did in OSP 12 is we actually released a security and hardening guide for Red Hat OpenStack Platform 12. And what we found out, um, this was Keith Basil's work, but uh, they, found, they went out and, and took all the different security profiles globally, boiled all their requirements down, and what they figured out is that if that we could meet FedRAMP, Etsy, and ANSI, we would, re we would meet 90% of the world's standards for controls on our OpenStack platform. And so that's where we're working right now, is we're leading the path forward to be able to apply these profiles onto an OpenStack cluster. Um, so that is a tremendous value from a security standpoint to be able to do that. Now, we have things in OpenStack, like uh, Keystone managing our user access. We have um, uh, Neutron handling network isolation for us. We have multi-tenancy, so projects are divided. They can't see each other's resources. But I can't do something like, say there's a, a user in a project that I want him to only see the things he owns in that project. Um, so that's where platforms can come in and get really, really granular with the role-based access controls on what they can see. Right, so CloudForms uh, role-based access control is insanely, insanely granular. Uh, we can limit what parts of the UI they can see and interact with. We can specify what actions they can do in a virtual machine. For example, we can say, this group is not allowed to take snapshots. This group is not allowed to power things down. Uh, they can maybe do a restart, but that's it. So here's an example. We're editing a user, and as Kevin mentioned, we're able to say that users can only see and interact with virtual machines they own, rather than things at the entire project level. Taking that a step further, we can also map uh, tenants in cloud forms one-to-one -one with OpenStack tenants, and then we can even subdivide them. So you can have like child tenants under an OpenStack project. So again, that allows for more granularity. It allows for you to uh, specify different quotas for different parts of a department, uh, all sorts of different practical applications for that sort of granularity. Going even further, we can also leverage tags in cloud forms to uh, act as a key value pair. So we can say that even though this user can normally only touch things that they own, we can whitelist certain things that they don't own that they can also see in the UI using tags. Yep, and what's nice about this is it's, it's taken advantage of the, the tagging capability of OpenStack internally. It's utilizing that so the resources that are being provisioned are being tagged the proper way, and then CloudForms is expanding that tagging capability up, up, above and beyond that. 
So what about a poli a, applying policy now? Right? So I mentioned the DISHAS FIG earlier. What if I wanted to enforce policy on that or uh, a zero-day vulnerability, for instance? Yeah, I alluded to this a little bit earlier when I was going through the, uh, the last demo. But CloudForm, since it has the ability to see into virtual machines and see things, see things like the packages installed and configured, here's an example of one that is going through and looking for the Bash package. If you remember, we had that shell shock vulnerability a couple years ago that affected certain versions of Bash, where you could run, run uh, malicious code with some overflow type statements. So what we're doing here is we're looking for the bash package to be installed, and then we're looking for the particular version and the build number that is affected by that vulnerability using regex searches. So using that, that condition for the policy, we're then able to assign actions to it. In this case, we're saying send an email to the security team, mark it as non-compliant, generate a log message. But since we can also leverage Ansible, we can go even further. We can like run a uh, update to make it compliant, to get the most recent version of that package that's not affected. We could uh, move it off to a uh, DMZ type cluster to do forensic analysis on it. All sorts of different possibilities with Ansible. And again, you can see here's an example of leveraging a custom button that is running an Ansible playbook to do day two operations. So again, you can do things like register with satellite, install packages through yum, uh, basically, the sky's the limit since we have Ansible at our disposal. Yep, and then uh, one thing we get commonly asked for is we need to be able to, to take this data that we've got about the systems and report on that data. And so CloudForms also gives that capability. Inside of OpenStack natively in Horizon, there literally is no, no formal reporting mechanism. And so CloudForms can give us that reporting capability. In this case, we're reporting on zero-day vulnerability, but we also may be just reporting on usage or utilization, and, uh, and so it's really nice to have this capability, right? Yeah, nearly all of the data CloudForms collects about virtual machines and hosts and providers as a whole is available in the reporting engine to be put into a consumable form through PDF or CSV or some other uh, text format that you would give out like via email or print a hard copy out. In this case, we're using that same regex expression we were looking at to find machines affected by shell shock and then we're putting them in the form of a report that's just uh, listing out the last time they were checked for compliance and then a simple pass fail as, as far as the apply, compliance status. And we can do things like color code the fields, um, assign different types of data to them like dollars and cents for chargeback reports. But again, it's all uh, customizable and easy to hand to like your executive leadership to get a quick digest of what's going on in the environment. Yep, and the, and the last thing to take this just a bit Further, if you've not heard of Red Hat Insights, so we can actually get proactive about our our uh, our systems and environment. So we can uh, we can uh, hook sites in our its instances into Red Hat Insights and the physical host themselves, feed that data into the analytics platform, and it will start generating proactive information back to us about our uh, known vulnerabilities, systems that need to be patched, etc. And this can be tied into CloudForms as well, right? Right, so uh, CloudForms has the ability also to integrate with Insights. It's much like you would do with any other Insights-enabled machine. You install the RPM necessary. Uh, in the case of CloudForms, you're going to make smart state collect that uh, machine ID file for Insights. And then what happens is it, it pulls the information out of the Insights portal. Now, if you're not familiar with Insights, it does do like predictive analysis based on like uh, open support cases and, and uh, KB articles and that kind of thing. So we can see like if we have a new vulnerability, it alerts you when there's a zero-day vulnerability. It also looks at support cases, so it can see like if you have things that are configured a certain way that other users have been experienced issues with, it'll alert you predictively to say, hey, this config issue file is a problem, change it, and this will resolve it. Yep, and the last thing out of that is Insights is now providing Ansible playbacks, uh, playbooks back to you as the end user to actually go take action on the recommendation from Insights. Um, so let's go in, uh, this last demo uh, is going to be of CloudForms going beyond provisioning. I wanted to show you uh, real quick just in uh, OpenStack sort of the security I have, right? So in my project itself, I have, uh, I have security groups that I can manage as a user, and this is basically my firewall rules across, so I can, I can uh, set these up. This is a CFME one that has specific ports open on that one. And I can combine these together. Um, and uh, CloudForms can take advantage of these. But OpenStack, not really done much more uh, beyond this. And the other thing is, there's no way for me to apply those policies I was talking about directly in here. So uh, being able to take and say, hey, that, that rel instance you just launched, it has an uh, a, uh, unverified or, or uh, uh, vulnerable instance of bash installed on that 
on that system. And so let's go ahead and see Cloud Forms how it can take this, this whole uh, setup further. Right, so this last demo here is going to be a pretty simple one, all things considered. What we're going to do is we're going to use a custom button. Again, this is going to call an Ansible playbook, and this is going to run a yum install process. Now, you can see my dialog was asking what packages. I had it set for, uh, I have an asterisk set there, which means it's going to do a yum update all, basically. So I kicked that workflow off. It's actually going to reach out to, in this case, this is running on an Ansible Tower server. Uh, and we're going to bring that Ansible Tower UI up. You can see it started that yum install slash update playbook. Um, it, notice it also synced inventory with CloudForms before it actually did that. So you have bi-directional communication between CloudForms and Tower as well so they can share inventory. But we'll click on this output of the playbook and you can see what it's doing. It's going through, it's uh, gathering facts. I'm going to tail the yum log on this particular virtual machine. So we'll see it start to actually go through and install packages. Uh, again, this is all being triggered by Ansible, by that custom button in CloudForms. And again, it can also be tied to things like automated workflows. It can be integrated with a provisioning workflow to make sure you have the most recent version of everything as part of the uh, wrapping up the deployment process. So use your imagination. You can do pretty much anything you want loving yep. Angible here. All right, so now let's talk about some customers that are actually using this, this setup to enhance their private clouds. So the first one we're going to talk about was a, a very big announcement of, of uh, a little while ago, and that is Verizon. So Verizon um, really s stood out up front picking OpenStack uh, up front. So a telco has, uh, say, a 10-year refresh cycle on technology. They have currently chosen OpenStack asset technology, and by far and away, uh, we are partnering with a lot of them globally on Red Hat OpenStack platform. Now, this uh, particular, uh, at the time of this announcement, they were doing 50 server racks across five different data centers. They mostly went with us because of our capability to lifecycle the clouds over time and our certified partnerships with uh, SDN provider Big Switch and Dell in this case. So they were doing SDN initiative with Big Switch already, and we were working with Dell. And we have, uh, in OpenStack, we have a um, service called DCI, Distributed Continuous Integration. And so Dell was actually the first one to utilize this. And what that means is they have infrastructure on in their premise where when our engineers drop a build, we ship, ship that build over to Dell. Dell starts running their automated testing, and this is how Dell can be certified on their hardware on the day we GA the product, which is really awesome. Um, the, the piece that takes us further, though, is they need to have visibility security baseline, and a better user experience across that whole environment. And that's where CloudForms come into the picture here. The next use case I'm going to talk about, I'm going to let Jason talk about it. It's one he and I did together out in San Antonio. And this is a really cool use case. Yeah, so last June, Kevin and I went out to San Antonio to visit uh, the Department of Defense, U.S. Air Force, uh, working with a partner called Radiance and uh, Thundercat. And what they were doing is, uh, they were, this is like cybersecurity for the, for the U.S. military. They're, they're doing all this sort of penetration testing against their applications, against servers, and they needed to be able to stand up large environments very quickly. So OpenStack was, was the obvious choice for, for that sort of uh, use case. Uh, the important thing to note is they actually already had OpenStack environments there, but there were a couple problems. They had no HA on the control plane. They had no shared storage, which means you can't live migrate instances. And the other thing was it was homegrown scripts to deploy it, so they had no what, real way to repeat these environments as they needed. So uh, what we came in, we were, we were pitted up a couple other vendors, and the whole story was really around OpenStack, but we didn't want to go in there just about OpenStack because we believe these other pieces are a bigger part of the puzzle, right? Right, so yeah, we were in a bake-off against these other vendors, and a lot of them were struggling just to get OpenStack up inside of a week. Uh, but we went a step further. We, not only did Kevin get OpenStack up in a couple of days, I came in right after him, layered down CloudForms, and that took it to a completely different level. Uh, this Tim Autry, who we've cited here in this quote, actually stood up when I was demoing CloudForms self-service and Ansible automation and said, I love CloudForms. So while they were focused on OpenStack, CloudForms was what really saved the day and was a key differentiator for us as far as winning that, uh, that use case. Yeah, so as a funny side note, too, we, uh, on the second day, we had OpenStack up and running. We had CloudForms deployed on it and Ansible Tower. And at 4 p.m., there was a huge explosion outside the building, and we lost power to the building. And yeah, the transformer so like blew up. We had about two minutes to shut down the cluster and make sure everything came back. And then we came back the next morning, pulled it back up, and started teaching them about building service catalogs. It was really awesome and fun. 
And they are now going forward, uh, they also partnered with our professional services team. And so we were able to bring, they have a low class in, install and, and a high class install. And so uh, we were able to bring consultants on board that were able to help and partner with them and work on those environments in either, in, uh, either case. So it's a really, really great use case. So last thing we'll show is Turbo up here. We re really recommend, if you're doing OpenStack, that you turbocharge it with Cloud Forms. And when you buy an OpenStack SKU, Cloud Forms comes with it to manage OpenStack. So we really push Cloud Forms for day two operations, security baseline, improving the user experience and all of that. So thank you very much for the time. If you uh, have any questions, we're, we're ready for them.